Let me see if I can strip away confusion about probing a western blot for multiple proteins. So a western blot is a technique that we can use to detect various proteins and sometimes we want to detect multiple proteins and so there are various ways to do that including stripping and reprobing um, as well as cutting into smaller pieces and probing separately using conjugated primary antibodies um, and yeah multiplexing where you just do them at the same time if you have different if you have compatible probes so here so we need to get back and talk about what the western blot's doing how these probes work and how we can take advantage of how these probes work in order to probe for multiple things so if you're still listening and you're interested in this topic i'm guessing that you have a basic understanding of western blotting but if not i have much more in other posts the basic idea is we're running, um, we use gel electrophoresis to separate proteins based on size, transfer them to a membrane, and then probe that membrane to see what whether a specific protein is there and how much of that protein. In addition to probing for specific different proteins, we can also probe for different modifications of proteins um, and things like that. Things like phosphorylation, glycosylation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm just going to talk in terms of probing for a protein um, because that is simpler and that's what we commonly do. I mean, it's just simpler terminology wise. The procedure is exactly the same, regardless what you're looking for. Okay, so speaking of what you're looking for, you might want to be looking for multiple things. And that's why we have these different methods that we can use in order to look for multiple things. So when we're running a Western blot, it's often to see how much different proteins are expressed under different conditions, um, or to see where in various, maybe you're doing some sort of protein purification and you have a bunch of things, you're trying to figure out which band's the protein that you're looking for and that sort of thing. So there are various reasons. But the most common is probably to look at the expression of proteins under different conditions. So you have multiple different samples, and then you want to look in those samples at the proteins. Maybe you want to look at multiple proteins. Um, maybe you're interested in seeing, okay, are these proteins expressed at the same time? Are they expressed at different times? Things like that. And um, so that's one reason why you could be looking for multiple things. Another is you're, maybe you're looking for like the normal version of a protein and the modified version, such as the like unphosphorylated and the phosphorylated version. So those are reasons why you might want to be looking for like multiple different things. And there's other times when you don't really care about other things, but you need to have some sort of control, some sort of loading control. So we have like housekeeping proteins, things like GAC-DH and actin that are expressed at like fairly constant and high levels in different, um, under different cellular conditions. And so we can use this as like a normalization to make sure that we're not just loading different amounts of cells, like so we don't see a big fat band and make, oh, that protein was expressed a ton of these cells, when really it was just you added a lot more of the sample. Um, and so that's another reason why you would be wanting to probe for two things, your protein of interest as well as the loading control. So especially with the loading control, there, there are gonna be some like extra stress, special strategies that we can use. Um, because we can often get like conjugated primary antibodies. So I'll go into that in a minute. Um, let's back up a second and talk about these antibodies because these are gonna come into play because they're one of the main factors determining what your strategy can be if you want to detect multiple things. So if we want to detect multiple things, our strategy is going to depend on what those things that we want to detect are, more specifically how close together in size that they are. If the bands are really close together, that's gonna to limit your options. And if your antibodies are from the same species, that's really gonna limit your options. So let me just back up and talk a little about how these antibody probing works. Typically you have, so these antibodies are these little proteins and they have these generic parts and these constant parts. And these generic parts are only generic for the animal that made them. So say if you had an antibody that was made in a rabbit, it would have this rabbit generic part and then these unique parts would be able to recognize the thing about like the specific part of your protein. So these unique parts are going to be recognize your thing of interest. And then the generic part is just kind of like a handle. Um, so this is going to bind directly to that protein that is in on the membrane. But then you also you need a way to detect this because this is going to be invisible. And so to, then we use a secondary antibody. And the secondary antibody is conjugated or it's strong, it's like attached to 
firmly attached to something detectable. So often these are fluorophores, so like fluorescent molecules, you shine light at one wavelength and they give back light at another wavelength. Um, they can also be like enzymatic reactions um, that take place like horseradish peroxidase. So there are various types of um, things that it could be conjugated to, but it's something that's going to allow you to detect it. And it also allows for amplification because you're able to have multiple secondary antibodies binding to that primary antibody. Um, and then the primary antibody, because, because the expensive part, like the actual conjugating it to the antibody, well, I guess like, I mean, of the antibody, the antibodies itself are really expensive typically, but it's more complicated if you have to then add, conjugate something onto it. And there's not that many people probably that are interested in that specific protein that you're looking for, at least not compared to the amount of people that would be interested in a secondary antibody. And so typically you can buy these conjugated secondary antibodies, but you don't really see conjugated primary antibodies except in the case of the loading controls, and this can come in handy as we'll get into. But the key thing is that the secondary antibody is going to recognize the generic part of the primary antibody, which means that the secondary antibody is gonna be like anti-rabbit if this was a rabbit antibody, or it would be anti-mouse if this was a mouse antibody. So this might be like goat anti-rabbit or something like that. So the, um, the, it's going to recognize the generic part. And so this generic part is going to be the same for all of the antibodies made in that animal. So if you have an antibody for protein A and an antibody for protein B, and they were both made in a rabbit, the secondary antibody that's anti-rabbit is going to recognize both of them. And this is going to be an issue if you have multiple proteins um, that are close together in size and on the um, that you're probing for it and you only have the primary antibodies that are made from that same animal. Um, and so that's gonna be a case when we have the most complicated method, which is stripping and reprobing. Well, let's start with some of the more simpler things. So what if you have that situation, but they're far apart in size, then you can actually just cut the membrane apart um, and probe them separately. This only works if they're far apart in size because if they're close together in size, you can't really cut them apart. Um, and yeah. But so this is one of the reasons why we typically load a pre-strained ladder um, and this molecular weight standard was then going to get transported to the membrane as well. And you're gonna be able to see it. Um, and so then you're going to be able to see where you um, cut apart, where you should cut the membrane. And note that these, um, these ladders, they often have like stronger bands and weaker bands like on purpose so that you could tell which band is which. And they also have um, colored ladders that, that, which can make it easier to tell which band is which as well, but those are gonna be a little more expensive. Okay, so this is going to work whether or not your antibodies were from the same primary, um, primary animal. So it'll work regardless, as long as they're different in size, you can just probe them separately. But if they're from the same, if they're from different animals, then it's easier to just probe them at the same time on the same membrane. Um, so what you can do is we call this like multiplexing, where basically you just mix together the antibodies, probe for them both at the same time, and then use secondary antibodies that have different fluorophores or different visualization strategies. So the key thing here, though, is you just need to keep in mind that you want your fluorophores to be compatible with one another. Um, so fluorophores have different like absorption um, and emission wavelengths. So remember, they absorb light at one wavelength and give it back at a different wavelength. So you need to make sure that they're not going to be like, one isn't going to be exciting the other. Um, you're not going to get bleed over between the different channels. Um, and so because people do a lot of this sort of thing, the antibody manufacturers, they make different ones that are going to, they'll tell you like these ones are compatible and these ones are compatible. Because you're dealing with secondary antibodies that have the conjugate, you can actually get like conjugated antibodies, um, like anti-rabbit antibodies at all of these different wavelengths with all these different fluorophores. And then you can pick and choose. Um, there are some that are like stronger signals than others. So you might want to choose based on not only are they compatible with one another, but you want, want to use the one that has a stronger signal if you have a lower abundance protein or a weaker antibody um, and that sort of thing. Um, so you can kind of be strategic about your fluorophore choice but doing at the them at the same time is only going to work if you have different 
um, different primary antibody um, hosts, or else you're just going to be having that secondary antibody binding, binding to um, binding to both of them, and you won't be able to tell them apart. Um, and so, if this the bands are close together, this is a really big deal. If the bands are farther apart, you might be like, oh, well, this one's where this one should be and this one's where this one should be. But the thing is, sometimes these antibodies are really, really bad. And there's just like random bands that are like consistently there, but they're at a totally different size than your actual, you know, the protein to be. Um, and so you don't want to get confused and be thinking that you are seeing your protein when it's actually something else. So if they're big enough, since far apart in size, you can cut them apart and do that. Um, another thing, just really quick, is that some, so we talked about, like, I briefly mentioned HRP, so horse virus peroxidase. You can actually, if you're using that method, you can use hydrogen peroxide to inactivate the horse virus peroxidase um, that is conjugated um, to the antibody. All right, let me find it. Um, so you can actually do that and then reprobe um, if, yeah, but <laughs> going back to, I'm going to focus more on like just the methods that'll work for whatever. Okay, so that is if you do the multiplexing um, with that. And remember that the multiplexing, it has to be from different primary, um, primary, your primaries have to be from different animals. Um, one kind of exception, but not really an exception, is a time where you don't have to strip if you want to reprobe, is if you have a conjugated primary antibody. So remember, this is con we can do this um, more commonly with things that are loading controls because the companies know a lot of people are going to want to use those. And so it's worth it to make um, the conjugated versions of that. So you might be able to get a, a conjugated version of um, like an anti-GAF-DH or an anti-actin antibody. Or, pro yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't guess it's that weird. But anyway, because it's already conjugated, you can just add it directly as is, and you don't need to do the primary and the secondary antibody. If it's from a different species as the other thing that you want to look for, from so if it's, because basically the secondary antibody that you add to look for the other, to your other product. If that secondary antibody is going to recognize the primary antibody that you're adding for that, the conjugated one, then that would, that would be a problem. In that case, what you could do is you could just scan the one first and then add this primary antibody after you already probed it with this one. Um, you don't need to do the stripping first. You prob um, might be a good idea to wash it a little, um, but it shouldn't interfere with things um, because this one's already conjugated to to the, um, to it, it's floor four or whatever. Um, if it's from a different species, then you can just go ahead and multiplex it like before, except you don't need to add a secondary antibody for it. Okay, finally, we have the more complicated form. And this is one I'm gonna go into a little more detail on how we actually go about doing it in practice and why, um, why it works. So this is stripping and reprobing. So basically, you want to use some combination of detergent, um, a low pH, a reducing agent, and or heat. But your goal is to basically denature those antibodies. So like unfold them, get them to unstick, and wash them off so that you can then plot, um, blot or probe for different things. And so this is helpful if you're using primary antibodies from the same animal and your bands are close together in size. Okay, so how do we go about this? Um, so there are, a couple, there are multiple different methods. Um, I will go over the method that I used, um, which is, I just got the recipe from the, um, this is not like a paid endorsement or anything, it's just, uh, this is what I used. Um, and it's similar to other protocols that I've seen. Um, so I use the mild conditions. So there's mild conditions and harsh conditions. And basically you want to start with the mild conditions. And if the antibodies just like aren't coming off, then you can move on to harsher conditions. But you want to start with those mild ones because you have to remember that you don't want to be disrupting your protein. You want to be disrupting the antibodies, those proteins, but not the proteins that you actually transferred to the membrane. 
you have a bit of a head start because the membranes that you transfer, they're kind of more fixed on there as opposed to the both the blocking enzyme and those antibodies that are kind of just more, um, they're bound more loosely. So they can come off more easily than your protein, um, which is kind of, when you transferred it, it was like unfolded and stuff and it probably had some sort of like methanol or ethanol, some sort of denaturant. Um, so your protein is pretty well stuck on there. But when we're doing this denaturing procedures and all of this harshness things, you're going to lose some of that protein. Um, and so this is kind of inevitable and it's less locked if you use a um, PVDF membrane instead of a nitrocellulose membrane. Um, and PVDF is also more sturdy. So if you want to do a lot of stripping and reprobing, the PVDF is a better option. Um, note that if you are doing like a fluorescence antibody um, conjugation, you want to use like a low fluor fluorescence membrane. They have like low fluorescent virgins. But anyway, you're going to lose some of your protein. And so you want to make sure that you're not trying to quantify between like different between like the before probing and after probing of different proteins. Um, you can see how much you're losing if you want by doing the same probing before and after, um, but you don't want to try to compare the levels of proteins in the two different ones uh, because some of the protein will be lost um, during the stripping and reprobing. And again, the harsher the conditions you use, the more you're going to lose. Um, so you also want to probe for the lower abundance protein first, um, or if they're both similar abundance, um, probe for the one that the antibody sucks more for. Um, so the one that it um, is going to have a weaker signal, regardless of how much protein is there. If you have the same amount of protein, one of the antibodies, if it's not as strong, it's going to give you a weaker signal. And so you want to use the weaker signal one first or the lower abundance protein first so that you don't um, because you're going to lose some of the protein, you want to start with a higher amount when, for the one that you have to lose um, when you have lost. So for the, uh, both of these conditions, we're going to use some sort of detergent. Um, so like my, the one I used today had SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, but we're familiar with that one. We used it earlier on. I'm um, in tween 20. This is what's the T in um, TBST. So we've been using this in our washes and blocking and, and incubation and things like that. So with detergent, it's going to help denature and defold the anti and fold the antibodies. And importantly, it's going to keep them soluble so they wash off. So this is one of the reasons why we like we use SDS in to run the gel is because it's going to coat the proteins once they're, um, once they're unfolded and allow them to travel through the gel in this soluble form rather than be like um, clumping up with one another. Detergents can do this because they have this like um, hydrophilic parts and these hydrophobic parts. Um, so the parts that water likes and the parts that water will, won't hang out with. So it's able to help keep them soluble and so that we can wash things off. For the mild strip conditions, we also help with um, denaturing those antibodies, getting them to um, get loosen their grip, um, come off of the membrane by using a low pH. Um, so for example, the one I used had 20 millimolar glycine, pH 2.2. Um, so you adjust the pH with like hydrochloric acid um, and the low pH is going to help with that denaturing. If gly glycine, yes, that's an amino acid, um, it also acts as a good buffer um, when you want a low pH. So we use glycine and like first glycine gels, various things we might be. Um, other times you might need to move to harsher conditions. Um, and so these harsher conditions, they often include heat. Um, so like 50 to 70 degrees, I was like, how do you heat a membrane? But apparently you can either use like a hybridization chamber thing, or you can stick the membrane in like a baggie, um, as a block baggie with the, um, with the antibody and, or with the strip buffer, and then like stick that in a water bath. Um, so there are ways to do it. Um, and often you're doing this in the hood because it has BME, so beta mercapta ethanol, and that's a reducing agent. And so basically what it can do is it can um, help break up the antibodies because these antibodies have multiple chains that are held together through these disulfide bonds. So these cysteine um, crosslinks and BME is able to break up those crosslinks and therefore get the antibodies to kind of fall apart, um, the chains to come apart.
um, because you're at with either of these, because you're adding like denaturing agents, um, and you're adding, um, you want to make sure that you wash well after you do the stripping. So typically you do several washes with the stripping agent, uh, or you do like, um, sorry, you do like a longer wash with the stripping agent. So 10 to 20 minutes or like 30 minutes. Um, and then you want to do washes with TBST afterwards. And those washes are important because when you add the antibody, when you add new antibodies, you want to make sure that you're not just like repel, like messing up those antibodies that you just added. Um, and um, you also probably want to reblot with some of the methods you need to, um, sorry, re reblock with some of the methods that like you need to, with some of them it's recommended. Um, so basically the blocking is done with like BSA or casein, um, or just like milk. Um, so basically there's little proteins coating all the regions of the membrane, the background region. And because those are proteins and because they're not stuck on there as strongly as your protein, they have they can get um, denatured and they can like wash off when you're doing all of this. And so just re-block it, re it and you're good to go. Um, well, hopefully you're good to go. You might wanna check if your stripping was sufficient. Um, so you can try to detect the signal and if you still see a strip signal, strip more. Um, so you can, you can wash off. So when you add the secondary antibody to see if you still see a signal, um, you can just wash it off without having to strip the membrane again, which would be kind of counterproductive because the secondary antibody is going to come off more easily, um, especially if there's nothing there for it to stick to. So you can just use several like washes with TBST. Um, just a little more detail about how you actually go about making this, making this mix. Um, so like, so this, this buffer, uh, the stripping buffer that I used has like glycine, um, and it's going to allow us to buffer it at that low pH, which we're going to get um, with HCl, hydrochloric acid, um, SDS, tween, um, and water. So just a note though about making it. Um, so we've, I've talked about tween before, how it's like this super duper viscous. Um, it's all goopy and syrupy, this detergent. So it's hard, like, first of all, I didn't make a liter, I just made 500 milliliters, but then you still have to pour out a lot of tween or we would have to pipette out a lot of tween, um, but I just poured it. Um, and so basically you can fill a graduated cylinder to a line, like, so fill it to like 95 microliters and then fill up the extra five uh, microliters, just pour in the tween until you get to that line, um, stick some paraffin over the top to mix it. And now you don't have to be pipetting that really viscous goop. Um, and it's going to make it easier when you're doing the shaking like this, then you can add it to your, to the rest of your solution without having to like try to get it to dissolve like all, when it's all gunky and then it sticks to the bottom of the tube and stuff. It's easier to like invert it to mix up on. Uh, speaking of mixing, so the, the, the glycine um, is good, like this powder. Um, and then the SDS is a powder and then the tween is this viscous stuff. Um, you want the, both the SDS and the tween are detergents, so they're going to get all bubbly. Um, you don't, you want to avoid like the foaming and the bubbles as much as possible. And you definitely want to avoid them when you're trying to see if your solid is dissolved. So start by dissolving the glycine. Um, so get like three quarters of the way or so with your liquid, um, or if you're doing the, this method where you have the tween added separately in a larger volume, um, you want to make sure that you leave plenty of room for that as well. Um, and then you, but basically you want to dissolve the glycine first so you can see it dissolve um, and you don't have all that bubbles and stuff. I didn't really have that much problem with bubbling though, because I was kind of careful, um, but so you do glycine, um, then the SDS, um, then I poured in the tween, and adjusted the pH with hydrochloric acid, um, adjusted the final volume, and voila, I had my stripping buffer. And I stripped my membrane, did some washes, and blocked it, re-blocked it, and now it is going overnight with the second thing that I want to test for. Um, and so, yeah, so I hope this helps, and I will post a link to that recipe, and there are other recipes out there um and find what works for you and hopefully you're doing this because you wanted to look for multiple things and not because you put the wrong antibody on that's not that's not what happened to me this time but it has happened to me before um so yeah
just 